You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 311 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. When we investigate the American Revolution, we often explore aspects of politics, ideology, trade and taxation, imperial control, and social strife. But what about religion? What role did religion play in the American Revolution? Catherine Carte, an associate professor of history at Southern Methodist University and the author of the book Religion and the American Revolution in Imperial History, joins us to investigate the role of religion in the American Revolution. Now, during our investigation with Kate, Kate reveals the role Protestant religion played in the British Empire from the 17th century through the American Revolution. Competition and cooperation among Great Britain's three privileged Protestant denominations, Anglicanism, Presbyterianism, and Congregationalism. And details about the role and impact of religion during the American Revolution and the founding of the new United States. But first, are you in need of a Ben Franklin's World mug, t-shirt, or tote bag? Perhaps a new Ben Franklin's World sticker or notebook? The Ben Franklin's World swag shop is open and has lots of swag to choose from. So whether you'd like to show your Ben Franklin's World pride with a new sweatshirt or hoodie, or perhaps with a new reusable shopping bag, the swag store has you covered at benfranklinsworld.com shop. And you can feel great about any purchase you make at benfranklinsworld.com shop because each purchase helps generate some funds to support this podcast. So please check out the swag shop at benfranklinsworld.com shop. Okay, are you ready to investigate the role of religion in the American Revolution? Let's go meet our expert guide. Our guest is an associate professor of history at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Her research specialty is in the religious history of early America and the Atlantic world. She's an award-winning author who has published two books, including her most recent book, Religion and the American Revolution, an Imperial History, which was published by the Omohundro Institute and its publishing partner, the University of North Carolina Press, in 2021. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Catherine Carte. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. To get right to it, Kate, you note in the introduction of your book, Religion and the American Revolution, that your book is an imperial history and that the imperial perspective is really what is at the heart of your work. So I wonder if we could start our conversation with these points. Would you tell us about the imperial perspective of your book and why you chose to write an imperial history about religion and its role in the American Revolution? That's a perfect place to start. So I think often we forget that the American Revolution divided an empire. We focus on what it did for the United States, which, of course, is a crucial part of the story. But at our starting point was actually the British Empire. So I was interested in religion in the British Empire. And as I started getting into the subject, as I started researching, the groundwork was who was talking to whom? What were the connections? What were the networks across the British Empire? What I found was that politics really lay at the center of that story. So for me, putting the word imperial in there was really important to point out that actually the empire itself, the political parts of the empire, its structure, the relationships that ran through governments, those things were really central to the religion that British colonists and their British counterparts in Great Britain, to their religion, that was super important in the late colonial period. So it actually doesn't sound like the empire of Great Britain, you know, at least during this mid 18th century period, which is the time that we're talking about, it really doesn't sound like the British empire was an empire that had a separation between church and state. Yes and no. And I think that's why this is such an interesting topic and why the story of what happens in the United States is so interesting. So it's a Protestant empire in the late 18th century. And that means that from a very sort of practical level, Religious organizations get a lot of support from the state. The king swears to uphold what the British Constitution calls the Constitution in Church and State. But at the same time, it's not one particular church. 
So when we tend to think of religious establishments, we tend to think of a government and a church. So that government supports this particular church. But a really interesting thing had happened in Great Britain in the early 18th century, the very early 18th century, and the end of the 17th century with the Glorious Revolution, where after William and Mary came to the throne, they established a religious settlement where they had the Church of England as the official Church of England. But the Church of Scotland, which is a different church in structure, that church was the official Church of Scotland. So the British Empire was Protestant because it wasn't Anglican and it wasn't Presbyterian. And then in the North American colonies, you have a third established church, you have the Congregational Church in North America. So in terms of the connections between church and state, on the one hand, they're really close because there's a lot of state support for religion. And on the other hand, they're kind of a little bit separated because it's more than one church. And that leads to a lot of kind of ambiguities about what exactly church and state looks like. But at the end of the day, the British Empire absolutely supported Protestantism, those different churches together as the sort of the bedrock of the empire. So Anglicanism, Presbyterianism, and in the North American instance, we have Congregationalism. So we have three denominations. And Susan wonders if you could provide us with a brief overview of these three faiths and tell us more about their connections to the British state and the British Empire. I really appreciate that question. You know, people who work in religious history end up throwing around denominational names and terms all the time. And very few people actually have any reason to know what those terms refer to or what distinguishes them from one another. So Anglicans were members of the Church of England. So it literally just means member of the Church of England. And the Church of England, the most important thing about that church for the purposes of this book is that it was a church that had bishops, which means it was an Episcopal church. That's what the word Episcopalian means. So today's Episcopalians are the descendants of the Church of England in the United States. So that's the Church of England. The Congregationalist churches are descendants of the Puritan movement. And what they had done was reject the bishop organization of churches. And so they are organized, as you can tell from the name, at the congregation level. They believe that the congregation was the spiritual unit that should oversee ministers. And they actually really believed in a little bit more separation between church and state because they want the congregation to be in charge of that minister. And then the third group, the Presbyterians, they put that role of overseeing clergy in sort of regional committees that are made up of both clergy and lay people that are called presbyteries. So what's really important about these three churches and the distinctions between them and the places they overlap is that they're pretty similar on a lot of theological points where they differ is on church organization. I mean, they differ significantly. Those are meaningful differences, but they really are on that level of church organization. And all those different groups are coming out of the English Civil War. So when they, in the Glorious Revolution, sort of agree to get along or agree not to persecute each other out of existence, they're agreeing to kind of work with one another on those church structures. And one of those three churches is established in virtually all of the British Empire, with the exception of Rhode Island and Pennsylvania. But basically everywhere, one of those three churches is established, mostly the Church of England. That's by far the largest. Thank you. That description is really helpful because I really think it allows us to see why scholars like yourself call Great Britain a Protestant empire. And it's because the empire has these three Protestant denominations, and none of them are really the favored religion of the state. The state really supports all three religions. Exactly. And, you know, the reason for that is because it's at the heart of the union between England and Scotland. And so very explicitly, when issues of church and state come up, you'll have legal actors in the British Empire say, this is a violation of the act of union. And as you can imagine, the union between England and Scotland is a really deep and important issue within British politics. It's really core. It's far more central than anything that has to do with colonial religion. And so because that's the bedrock that this settlement is based on, it makes it really, really kind of solid across the empire. It's not something that the British Empire would willingly change. We've talked about three Protestant faiths in Great Britain, but in the North American context, many people will say, well, don't forget the Quakers, don't forget the Lutherans, don't forget the Dutch Reformed Church, don't forget the Moravians. I mean, there's really many other Protestant denominations in colonial British America. But you point out in your book, Kate, Religion in the American Revolution, that while neither Anglicanism, Presbyterianism, or Congregationalism is the dominant state religion, 
all three of these religions share a privileged place within the empire. Could you tell us what it meant for these three Protestant denominations to have a privileged place in the British Empire? And what exactly were the privileges that Anglicanism, Presbyterianism, and Congregationalism enjoyed? Well, the most basic one is tax payments in some part of the empire, right? So in all three of those denominations support the idea of religious establishment because they benefit from it in a major portion of the empire. So that's kind of the most basic thing. But I think the other way to come at this is to think about the idea of legitimate religion. And it's an idea that I think we run into today when we kind of think, well, that's a joke religion or, you know, Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster is a long standing kind of satire movement on religion, right? And it's intentionally saying this isn't legitimate religion. So what the British Empire did was really define the boundaries around legitimate religion. And it looks like established Protestantism. So it means you have churches that have ministers and ministers have particular sort of privileges within the state. It means that the theological disputes you have between each other, the state isn't going to get involved in that. That's considered sort of normal difference of opinion. Whereas somebody who's standing on the street corner and burning Bibles, that's a criminal act to the state. That's not legitimate religion. So the state is allowing the kind of normal activity that goes on within these churches. And by the way, within all those other churches you mentioned, right, with the Lutherans and Dutch Reformed and Moravians and Quakers and all those groups, they're kind of beneficiaries of this system because what they do is considered legitimate also. So they kind of get these sort of protections as long as they continue to play by those rules. And where they challenge those rules, they run into some difficulties. You know, the Moravians do when they ordain women and the Quakers have more troubles because they don't have a settled clergy in the same way. But for instance, in particular, foreign Protestants who are welcome in the empire, foreign Protestants are just fine in this system. And so the state kind of puts boundaries around what religion should do. And first and foremost, religion should be loyal to the state, right? So religion cannot disrupt the state. You mentioned earlier that After the Glorious Revolution of 1688, England and then Great Britain becomes a Protestant empire. And this Protestant empire is a place with a strong Protestant faith and a strong Protestant identity. Kate, how normal or unusual was it for England and Great Britain to be a Protestant empire during the 17th and 18th centuries? Well, in Western Europe in the late 17th century, you have the world divided into Protestant and Catholic empires. And of course, William of Orange, who comes and becomes the monarch in England, is coming from the Netherlands. So you have a sort of alliance of Protestant countries. The term they use for it is the Protestant interest, which operates in foreign politics. But England and then Great Britain is by far the dominant force in that system. So they kind of overwhelm, you know, the Dutch and the Danish and the other much smaller fellow travelers there. And then on the other side, you have the Spanish and the French, particularly the French, who are Catholic. Of course, the word that Brits would have used in those days would be papist. It's a slur, meaning that they're subject to tyranny. They embrace, you know, awful tyrannical popes and monarchs that are intending to take over the world. So it sets up this kind of clash of cultures between Protestant empires and Catholic empires. And that was really important to British political life and also to North American political life. The idea that the Catholics were the others who were the enemies. And it justified a lot of political action. When we've spoken with other scholars about religion in early North America, and these are scholars who study French America or Spanish America, they talk a lot about how the French and Spanish use Catholic missionaries, usually from the Franciscan or Jesuit orders, to go out into indigenous communities to try and convert Native Americans and to extend their imperial holdings throughout Native North America. Is this something the British tried to do as well with Protestant missionaries? Absolutely. The Church of England does it in a fairly broad-based way through the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. And then the various New England groups send out missionaries too. And this is a place where you can really see the Protestant empire kind of in action because the leaders of all of these different denominations, they all agree that the goal of the Protestant empire is to ensure that Protestantism, which is the true faith, comes to the people that they are meeting through the process of empire, whether that's enslaved people or indigenous people. And so they have their armies of missionaries too, and they really make villains of those Catholic missionaries. They are there in part to push back against that force that the Catholic empires have been sending out. 
Is there perhaps an on-the-ground example you could give us of this Protestant imperialism at work in North America? And by Protestant imperialism, I do mean the British missionary work that we've just been talking about, which you happen to call Protestant imperialism in your book, Religion in the American Revolution. Well, one good example that I talk about in the book a bit is this society that New Englanders tried to found in the 1760s, which would have been, had it gotten off the ground, the first missionary organization based in the colonies. So it's an important part of these structures of imperial Protestantism that the money's always coming from Great Britain and then the sort of foot soldiers are in the colonies. But the people in Massachusetts wanted to found their own missionary society. And so they were eager to send out missionaries. They had been working with British societies and sort of they knew how to kind of find the missionaries and send them out. They wanted to do their own. So they organized a missionary society and they passed a law to support it. And then when that law sort of went up the food chain, the hierarchy of the Church of England got wind of it and got very upset and said that this was going to compete inappropriately with Church of England missionaries. They couldn't really say that explicitly because you can't make any political room out of competition in that world, right? They're all supposed to be working for the good cause. So they say, well, we can't actually object to this, but... So the way they work around it is that they point out that these Massachusetts missionaries will be too far from the imperial administrators who are dealing with indigenous policy and that it'll be disruptive to indigenous policy. And they ultimately get the project quashed. So that's kind of an example of it not working, but it's also an example of it working at the same time, right? So what we see is that Protestant missionaries were less successful than those Catholic missionaries in part because of some of these issues, but also that they all agreed, all of these different denominational groups agreed that they ought to be spreading the word, that they ought to be working in missionary contexts. And then lastly, that they all deferred to the same imperial leaders. So when those imperial leaders, when the Privy Council says this society can't be founded, it isn't. And in fact, there isn't a North American-based missionary society until after the American Revolution. Was this quiet interdenominational competition that the Anglicans couldn't talk about, but everyone knew existed? Was this competition over money or was it over some other aspect of imperial administration? I mean, this is where the kind of belief really matters. So two of the biggest communities within this imperial Protestant structure are the Anglicans, the Church of England group, and then the group that includes the Congregationalists, but then also their sort of fellow travelers in Great Britain. And we call those dissenters, right? It includes a lot of Presbyterians in the colonies. And Anglicans and dissenters had been fighting pretty aggressively since the English Civil War. By the time we get to the late colonial period, they're not fighting militarily, but they do see each other as opposed in promoting sort of the true religion. They have real theological differences. And so the competition is kind of rooted in that, in that it's still Protestantism if the person's converted by the other group, but it's not the right kind of Protestantism. So they're competing in those terms. But what's important is because they're deferring to the same overarching structures, they have to kind of manage that competition. So sometimes they find ways to beat each other. And then just as often, they'll kind of back up and they'll say, well, let's go into different zones. We'll missionize in different territories. And you'll see them talk about true religion. They'll use that phrase. And they'll say, well, what we really need to do is make sure everybody has access to true religion. And they'll just kind of allow each other to go into separate places. You've told us about how the British Empire provided structure for these three preferred Protestant denominations and really set the standards for how these Protestant denominations were to act with each other on the ground. And you've also talked about how the Congregationalists, Anglicans and Presbyterians were really supposed to be relatively equal in terms of the power and preference they derived from the empire. But I'm thinking here of an example in Boston. In Boston, it's a Congregationalist controlled town. And they really don't want the Anglicans to be a part of their town or to move in. And this proved problematic because the English crown says, no, Anglicans have to be allowed to worship anywhere in the English empire and Boston needs to erect an Anglican church. Well, Bostonians went so far as to basically legislate. They put it into law that if you weren't a Congregationalist, then you couldn't own land in the town of Boston. So when Governor Edmund Andros comes in to establish an Anglican church, He basically takes land from the first burying ground by eminent domain because no one owned land in the burying ground. And that's where he builds the King's Chapel, which is what the Anglican Church was called in Boston. So 
I really think here we can see animosity between Congregationalists and Anglicans. And I'm just curious, what is the structure of denominational power in these early American cities? And was it unique for these imperial privileged denominations to actively compete against each other on the ground in the English and later British North American Empire? So it changes over the course of the 18th century. So in the late 17th and early 18th century, you see some of that stuff a little bit more aggressively. And Actually, in Massachusetts, an interesting thing happens where after the new charter comes in in 1692, they have to tolerate Anglicans. Massachusetts has to tolerate Anglicans. That's part of the Glorious Revolution for Massachusetts. So the Anglicans can legally be there without being persecuted. However, that doesn't mean anybody has to like them. And they struggle with a certain amount of persecution and just difficulties. And early 18th century Anglican leaders actually appeal up the chain of command up to London and say, it's wrong for there to be a church establishment in North America that is not Church of England, arguing that, in fact, you know, leaving the Scotland issue aside, these are English colonies, they're not British colonies, and they should have the Church of England established. And the Solicitor General in England says, no, that's actually not the case, that Massachusetts and Connecticut can have congregationalist establishments. And that's kind of typical of what happens is that, you know, you'll get one group that's pushing really hard one way or the other. There's some pretty intense persecution in Virginia in the 1740s and 1750s too by Anglicans of dissenters. And they'll kind of appeal it up. And authorities in Britain will say, you're taking it too far. Nobody's going to win this fight. The fight can still go on on the ground in the colonies. People continue to dislike each other on denominational grounds. So it's not that everybody loves each other, but that no one can win. We've really been laying a lot of groundwork here, getting the context that we need so that we can really understand where religion stands in the empire's North American colonies by the mid 18th century. So, Kate, by the 1760s and 1770s, the eve of the American Revolution, where does religion stand in the North American colonies? What is the status of England and Britain's Protestant empire in North America on the eve of the American Revolution? You know, there's a way that I think we often want to do this thing where we sort of, that's what I say to my students, we want to slice everybody open and get some sort of number for how much they care about religion. And then we'll quantify it. We'll say these people were religious and these people were less religious. And it just doesn't work like that. So if we're assessing where things are in the late colonial period, I would say these institutions are really important and they're really healthy and they are allowing, you know, kind of the flourishing of groups like German reformed and things like that without persecution. So the kinds of religious persecution that are going on is relatively sustainable. It's maybe not pleasant for anybody who's undergoing it, but it's sustainable for the society. One measure of that is that people, Protestants, are not making their choices about where to migrate in the empire based on religion, for the most part. Foreign Protestants are being recruited to places like Georgia and Nova Scotia, the last founded colonies. The British, when they want to increase those colonies, they're eager to bring in Huguenots, they're eager to bring in German Protestants. So there's a certain amount of comfort for legitimate Protestants across the empire. That doesn't say anything about how religious people are, right? So I think that's a question you'd have to answer like for a particular community. What we do see in the late colonial period is that the awakening movement, what we associate with the Great Awakening, has really flourished also. But before the revolution, the vast majority of people who were in awakened movements chose to stay within dominant denominations. So it's not that there isn't friction. And certainly people who are adhering to the awakening movements are often very energized about their faith, energized about the ways they're sort of rebuilding their lives around their faith, but they're doing it within those structures of imperial Protestantism rather than trying to tear them down. Could you provide us with a quick reminder of what the Awakening Movement was and what it entailed? What we call in North America the Great Awakening, the North American portion of it starts in the early 1730s. The European part of it starts earlier. And what it is is an effort by Protestants in sort of a variety of established churches, particularly in the Netherlands and in Germany and Eastern Germany, and then in Great Britain, to revitalize their piety and to worry a little bit less about some of these distinctions about, you know, who has bishops and who doesn't, and some of the sort of theological stuff that had been so important in the 17th century. The Awakening Movement sort of pushes back on that and says, let's focus on religious experience 
we associate this with the rise of a belief in the new birth, right? So in the spiritual awakening in that sense, being born again, the sort of modern phrase there. And the leaders that we associate most with this that people are most likely to have heard of are George Whitfield and then John Wesley, who founds the Methodist Church. The Moravians are key in this. Jonathan Edwards in Massachusetts. So those people spread the awakening movement very explicitly. They have a lot of missionaries. They tend to be working predominantly with other white Protestants. They do have missionaries to non-whites, but fewer in this early period. And they are spreading that movement within those denominations. And it's quite disruptive because they embrace revivals and they embrace a more emotional style of religion. So that is disruptive within late colonial religion. But like I said, it's staying within those denominations before the American Revolution. Thank you for that reminder. Now, there are many causes of the American Revolution, but one of the biggest causes was that during the French and Indian or Seven Years' War, Great Britain had doubled its national debt and doubled the size of its empire by adding colonies all over the world to its control. So one of the biggest consequences of this war was that Great Britain needed to raise revenue to pay off its debt, and it needed to develop a more robust and centralized system for colonial governance. I mean, how else are you going to control colonies all over the world? But in North America, the colonists resisted this need to raise revenue, and it resisted the need to centralize governance under a more controlling imperial system. And we can really see that resistance in the protests that we talk about when we talk about the American Revolution. So one of the instances of revolutionary protests that took place, and this is where many scholars of religion begin their discussions about the American Revolution, is with the Anglican bishop controversy. Kate, we need to take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, but this controversy is where I think we should dig in and start when we get back. Hi, I'm Carolyn Eastman of Virginia Commonwealth University, and my newest book, The Strange Genius of Mr. O, The World of the United States' First Forgotten Celebrity, is out now. During the early 19th century, James Ogilvie was the very face of eloquence. He had been a burned out immigrant school teacher who discovered that he had a real knack for the spoken word, delivering thoughtful and passionate speeches. And in 1808, he decided to abandon the schoolroom and undertake a career as a traveling public speaker. The reason why Ogilvy matters so much to the history of early America is that he was, in essence, the first great public speaker who vast numbers of early Americans were able to see. He was somebody who was terribly eager, not just to make a name for himself, but also to help Americans imagine a kind of maybe not unity, but at least he could get them unified in thinking together about the same subjects. And he succeeded. (laughs) One of the most remarkable things about his story is how long he succeeded in doing exactly that. Be sure to pick up your copy of The Strange Genius of Mr. O wherever you buy your books. And if you'd like to purchase your copy of The Strange Genius of Mr. O at a 40% discount, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Mr. O and use promo code 01BFW. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Mr. O and use promo code 01BFW. Kate. Would you tell us about the Anglican bishop controversy? And Dan would really like to know what role this controversy played in creating pro-revolutionary sentiments. So that's a great, great question. And you're right, we tend to frame it in terms of the sort of growth of the empire and the challenges caused by the growth of that empire. But the need to have a Church of England bishop in the colonies actually way predated that. So as the colonies had been founded, religion had not sort of been chief in the minds of most people most of the founders of those colonies. And so the colonies where the Church of England was established did not have any local bishop. And this was a big problem for the Church of England. So it's the largest church in the empire, but all of its bishops are in England, England and Wales. So the American Anglicans, many of them are eager to have a bishop in the colonies. But the complicating factor here is that bishops also sit in the House of Lords And creating bishops 
with political power, without political power, is a really complicated issue for Parliament. And there actually hadn't been new bishops created in over a century, I think, in Great Britain. So it's not an easy process just to sort of plop a bishop down. And it becomes very political. So as you get closer to the American Revolution, and just like you're saying, Colonists are getting very worried about the extension of British authority into the colonies. What happens is that the people who are asking for a bishop, they increase their calls for a bishop. And authorities in Britain see that having parliament create a bishop would be politically catastrophic at that particular moment. So it's a non-starter from a political issue. Parliament recognizes that they would rather be able to raise taxes than be able to put a bishop in the colony. So they're going to put the tax issue first. But people in the colonies who are scared about a bishop coming in, because it has to come from parliament, they are seeing it as a potential example of parliamentary overreach. So that's sort of the traditional story there. I put the emphasis in that story on the fact that it was never going to happen. And everybody involved knew it wasn't going to happen. Even the Archbishop of Canterbury, who really wanted a bishop for the colonies. He was a strong advocate for a strong colonial church. He knew explicitly that this was not an issue he could push on politically. So what happens is that you have sort of arguments about the problem and about why Anglicans don't have a bishop in, say, 1765, 1766, even up into 1768. And then because the conversation isn't shifting, there's no sort of resolution to this it kind of takes a turn. And the people who are governing that conversation become more likely political agitators than religious leaders. And it moves into the political realm. And there it has a short life, just a couple of years, and then it fades. So by 1770, this isn't an issue people are really arguing about much anymore because they have much more pressing issues of parliamentary overreach to talk about. And then when you get to the final crises in 74, 75, it's nowhere on the radar. So why do scholars list the American bishop controversy as one of the motivations or causes of the American Revolution if everyone who was really in the know knew that this was a non-starter, that there was zero chance that North America was going to get an Anglican bishop? You know, I think there are a few reasons for this. I think one is that some of the prime thinkers on the New England side here, it's important that they are using the bishop controversy to talk about structures of political authority. So it does come up in some of those early pamphlet debates. But I think the more sort of sharp change in the field is that in the 70s and 80s and even into the early 90s, the field was really concerned with questions of ideology in the American Revolution and really focused on the 1760s with an assumption that when the ideological context of the American Revolution comes together, that the revolution itself sort of becomes inevitable. And I don't agree with that at this point, and I don't think that's where the field is now. I think those ideological actors who are principally sort of New England actors in the 1760s are now seen as one piece of a much larger puzzle. So it was an important issue for those folks, but it was not an issue that I would say if we look at the whole spectrum of what causes the American Revolution, that becomes sort of a tipping point issue. So do you see Protestant religion as playing a role in causing the American Revolution? This is a hard question. I would say overall, no. What I do see is that for people who passionately believed in the revolutionary cause, particularly in New England, in the theology of New England, you could find good support for that protest. Another thing you can say is that as people were moving through the stages of revolution, sort of trying to understand whether it was right to be rebelling, They do ask those questions in religious terms. And religious leaders, again, principally in New England, are significant in helping people feel comfortable with the idea that a tax revolt is a legitimate grounds to base this fight on, right? That it's a much bigger fight. It's not just you're not paying your taxes, right? You are willing to render under Caesar when Caesar is just, but there's a reason why it's not anymore. So there are some really important places there that I don't think we should underplay. But when we look at the whole story and we kind of decenter just those people, then I think religion is not really functioning to push revolution. And it certainly isn't if we look at this transcolonially. It's not pushing things in the South. It's not pushing things particularly in the middle colonies. It's a New England story, I think. Now, while religion may not have served as a cause of the American Revolution, it certainly played a big role in the revolution in really helping Americans sort out which side of the conflict 
they wanted to support. Kate, could you tell us about the role the Protestant clergy played in trying to help Americans think through the revolution and the different sides there were to support? They have two really divergent roles. One is that they can choose to partner with government structures and support a political side. And a lot of religious leaders do choose to support the American Revolution for a whole variety of reasons, mostly, I think, because they agreed with it. And they help by speaking on fast days, by joining up as chaplains, all of those things, they help support the cause. And then there's a different group of clergy who either refrain from taking a political stance or who actively support the British, right? And that's particularly true for Church of England clergy. And the best spokespeople for the English cause, for the British cause in North America during the war are Church of England clergy people. We think of Samuel Seabury from Hamilton, right? You know, he's kind of the butt of a joke in Hamilton, but he and others like him played a legitimate role there in kind of saying, war is not the right answer here. That's the public role. The other role that I think we often forget is the pastoral role. Once the war breaks out, there's a lot of damage and danger and chaos. One of the most striking archival things about this project was when I would go into congregational level records, a really large percentage of the time, there'd be a gap in the church records for the war years. And that's because of the disruption. So clergy in that period, they are concerned about their congregations in the way that I would hope my clergy would be concerned about me, right? So checking on people who've been sent hither and yon, worried about their own safety, you know, they're caught up in the war too. And I think that's an important part that we forget. A lot of scholars have talked about how invasion is an agent of revolution, right? So people were ambivalent before the war, that could include their clergy people. And then the British army comes in or the American army comes in and it motivates people one way or the other. And there's a lot of disruption and the clergy are right there with people. And they're probably going to be trying to help with kind of immediate issues. So I think that's an important part of the story, too, just to remember that these religious institutions and the people who lead them also went through the war. Another aspect that I found really interesting while reading your book, Religion in the American Revolution, was just how much turmoil the revolution caused, specifically for Anglicans and Anglican clergy. It really seems like the Anglicans had really tough decisions to make as to which side that they would support. Could you tell us What made it so tough to be an Anglican during the American Revolution and why their experience was so rough? Well, so this is a place also where I think institutions really matter. So an individual clergyman in the Church of England, probably in a southern colony, that's where the majority of them were, would have to make a choice about who to support and how to support that side. So their oaths of office, their oaths that they take as part of becoming ordained as clergy require them to swear allegiance to the Church of England and the king. And as Peter Walker has argued, this is a really important spiritual event, this oath. This oath has spiritual content. It's not just a kind of lip service. So for them, they have an obligation to follow the church. And also the Church of England is unequivocally clear that the rebellion is wrong. So if they choose to follow the revolution, they're breaking with a spiritual connection and also with their hierarchy. And there's no American body to buffer that because there's no organization of American Anglican clergy across the colonies, right? There's no sort of structure there that's going to buffer them. So they're faced with their congregants. Now, the majority of their congregants, or in many places, many of their congregants are going to be following the revolution. If we think about a place like Virginia or Maryland, where revolutionary spirit was fairly high. So are they going to follow their local congregations? George Washington is an Anglican, right? So there are plenty of visible Anglicans who are supporting the American Revolution. They can go that side, but then they've ruptured with their church. And also there's a belief in the Southern colonies in particular that the Church of England itself might represent British authority. They don't really think that before the war, but once the war breaks out, they're willing to stop paying for the Church of England, let's put it that way. So they might be losing their income, right? So these are really complicated choices. We see people like Jonathan B-O-U-C-H-E-R. I don't know if that's Boucher or Boucher. I've asked lots of historians and I've never heard a uniform agreement on it, but we'll call him Boucher. So Jonathan Boucher ends up going armed to church. And then he flees to England. And a lot of people make that choice or else they flee to Nova Scotia. And then there's this famous story about Muhlenberg, Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, who joins up as an American military leader, apocryphally from the pulpit. That's probably not true. 
So you'd see these really sort of stark choices on that side. That's a really helpful explanation because I think we can definitely see how religion played a role in helping people to consider which side they would support during the Revolution and Civil War. Now, another aspect that I found really interesting while reading your book, Religion and the American Revolution, was the role that the Franco-American alliance played in religious discussions in revolutionary America. You know, you mentioned Hamilton Cape. And if you go to see that play, the French were a godsend. You know, they help at the Battle of Yorktown. But when we look at the larger picture you paint in your book, there seemed to be a lot of talk about religion when it came to the French and American alliance. Could you tell us more about the Franco-American alliance and how this alliance really challenged some American Protestant ideas about religion? Align with the French is a no-brainer for the Americans from a military perspective. And there are plenty of people right from the beginning of the revolutionary moment, revolutionary leaders who are eager for that to come together because France is Britain's historic enemy, so that it seems like a good source of funds. They have also spent the better part of a century fighting the French on the grounds that they are papist and, you know, tyrannical. So it's an uncomfortable alliance, at least on that level. So it's actually quite interesting how quickly of course, the alliance doesn't come together until 1778. But how quickly the religious leaders who are supporting the revolution support that alliance. They do have to kind of talk themselves through it a little bit. So they don't say, well, this is great, we'll all become Catholic. Instead, they say things like, this will be an opportunity for us to show the Catholic French what liberty really looks like. And they'll say, isn't it ironic that the Catholic French are supporting liberty in this way when the British have abandoned it. The British are actually the corrupted, tyrannical ones, and the Catholics are the true friends of liberty. So they kind of talk themselves around to it. It's an easy argument for loyalists, on the other hand. Loyalists say, well, look, the colonists have completely abandoned any pretense of supporting liberty. And actually, the British do too. The British, when they see the Americans join up with the French, they feel betrayed on two levels. One, because the colonists have joined up with the French, and they're already betrayed there but also because the French had promised they wouldn't support the revolutionary regime right at the beginning. And so they're betrayed on that level too. So that's more evidence of sort of Catholic perfidy and, you know, the terribleness of the papists. So it becomes kind of a complicated moment when leaders and I think followers are kind of looking around and figuring out where the connections between religion and government really need to be. I think the outcome of it for the Americans that's so important is that after that, the United States really can't be a Protestant country, at least not in any kind of official capacity for some time to come, right? They can't, during the war, fight on behalf of Protestantism because they're fighting with Catholics. And it starts to expand that definition of legitimate religion in a really meaningful way. It makes it harder for colonists or then early U.S. citizens to argue that Protestantism is the most important thing. And we do really see a sharp decline in anti-Catholicism in the United States during the revolutionary period. Of course, it comes back, particularly in the 1830s. It's not a permanent decline. But during the revolutionary period, there's a sharp decline in anti-Catholicism. So what happens to religion in North America after the United States achieves its independence from Great Britain in 1783? You mentioned that the United States can't just be seen as a Protestant nation like Great Britain can be seen as a Protestant nation because it joined forces with the Catholic French to obtain its independence. So what role did religion play in the new republic? So I like to think of it as sort of going back to essentials. So at the federal level, first in the Articles of Confederation, and then of course in the Constitution, federal leaders realize that there is no practical way to recreate a Protestant empire. It would take a lot of political work, and there isn't a lot of belief that it's a good idea. In the century since the Glorious Revolution, there's been a real increase in, you know, following thinkers like John Locke, a real increase in people believing, particularly elite leaders, that religion should be a matter of conscience and left out of politics, and that's how you avoid conflict. So there isn't a lot of political incentive at the federal level to sort of pull everything together. At the state level, what they've lost is that superstructure that told them what was legitimate religion and what wasn't, that superstructure that kept one group from persecuting another group out of existence. And they have to work those questions out for themselves. And that turns out to be really challenging. In South Carolina, for instance, South Carolina writes a state constitution that establishes the Protestant religion sort of officially in those terms. 
but then has to dismantle it pretty quickly. They try to define what a Protestant religion looks like, but it's just too complicated. And there are a lot of voices that don't want any kind of connection there. And so it just sort of filters away. And you see this, you know, we think of it as a rise of religious liberty, but I don't think of it so much in this early period in the 1780s and early 1790s. I don't see that as an ideological phenomenon as much as it's a practical phenomenon. They've got a lot of things on their plate and trying to pull people together around religion is not looking like a good idea, not looking like it'll be successful. So the real consequence for the early United States is that they kind of have to start over and things that particularly religious leaders had taken for granted, support from the state, not just financial support, but rhetorical support and kind of legitimacy, those things are gone. You know, if we think about the United States and religion today, one idea that often comes to our mind is the separation of church and state. This is the idea that the structures of government and religion are separate from each other and should be separate from each other. Kate, how did the separation of church and state come about? Was this separation a result because it seemed impossible to create a Protestant empire in the new United States, or did it result because of something else? So I don't think of it as a separation as much as I think of it as a collapse. So those connections that had existed in the British Empire sort of fall apart. They're not there anymore, and they're not reconstructed. And then in that moment when people are kind of reassessing what everything is, one of the things they're reassessing is what qualifies as religion. Are Jews going to be included? Are atheists protected? Or are atheists inherently a threat to the state? They don't answer those questions quickly. So in the 19th century, what happens is we see a lot of, you know, they don't tend to be as much legal as they are legislative, but struggles over where religion and politics or where religion and the state can intermingle. And it's often at the local level. So there's a famous Maryland Jew bill, which doesn't pass until I think it's 1826, which allows Jews to participate fully in public life. In a lot of places, clergy are banned from participating in public life. The most easy thing, which is state support for a particular church, we see that fall away pretty quickly, except in Connecticut and Massachusetts. But the more complicated issues, and people like Sally Gordon and Alyssa Penick are working on this stuff in really interesting ways, the more complicated things are like, who gets to own property? Does a church get to incorporate? So I don't think that separation of church and state is a clean idea. It's true that that phrase is old. It predates Jefferson, I'm pretty sure. And Jefferson, of course, talks about a wall of separation between church and state. But that's not a legally binding document. It's a letter that he writes to some Baptist. And even in the 20th century, you get things like the Lemon Test, uh, Supreme Court test, trying to define, you know, exactly what does it mean to have church and state intermingled? We haven't got it sorted out. So I really think of this as a sort of permanent argument in American political life, rather than I think of it as something that gets settled. It is interesting because when we talk about the separation of church and state, we do talk about it as if it's a settled idea. And yet it sounds like on the ground, even today, it's really not a settled issue. No, it's not here in Texas. I can tell you that for sure. Kate, what is one thing you wish more people better understood about the role of religion in the American Revolution? I wish they thought of the revolution as really painful and disruptive for religious communities. And I think that in part because I think that about all wars. We have to remember that war is destructive and painful, and it involves the rupturing of communities particularly a civil war like the American Revolution, something that splits a polity that had functioned for a long time. And so if we start from that place, if we start from realizing that a lot was broken by the war, causes us to kind of look backwards and see there was this thing before that got broken. There was this Atlantic imperial Protestantism. And then on the other hand, it causes us to look forward and say, the people who start putting things together in the early republic, they have memories of what they've lost And they're working with tools they didn't pick. And so there's a lot of anxiety in the early republic about the place of religion in public life. There's anxiety from people who don't want it. And there's anxiety from people who do want it. Amanda Porterfield's book, Conceived in Doubt, is brilliant on this. You know, there's just a lot of anxiety. That's what I would put back in. Now we should hop into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion, 
opinion, Kate, what might have happened if early Americans had not chosen to collapse the realms of religion and government in the new United States? What might the history of the early United States look like without this collapse? If the federal government had found a way to build the United States as a Protestant country, there's a lot of religious nationalism in 75 and 76. So if that had carried forward into a structure, and it would have to be kind of a three-part grouping of Anglicans in the South or Episcopalians then in the South and Presbyterians in the Middle Colonies and Congregationalists in the North, if those three groups could have collaborated, it's possible we would have seen the United States move more towards a European-style church establishment, where they are now, where there are generalized funding for sort of official or heritage churches, but a much stronger social state that goes along with that. Sort of a decline in religion and the rise of social services is kind of what you get there. And that's the only way I can see the U.S. having ended up there. So, Kate, do you have a new research project that you're working on? Is there perhaps a new aspect of religion in the American Revolution that you're writing about now? Well, because of COVID, I'm mostly fantasizing about it. My next project actually goes back into the 17th century. So I got obsessed as I did this project on finding maps that have the word Protestant on them that predate the American Revolution. I know of one. I know of exactly one map drawn in 1635 that has the word Protestant on it. And I've been looking for 13 years. So in my fantasy world, your listeners will send me 25 more. But I am interested in specifically in cartography and religion and how before we get to thematic maps, how we use religion to understand space, specifically human difference. Anyway, I'm fascinated right now. So it's going back into the 17th century. I have to go learn secretary hand. So you've heard it here. If you come across any maps with the word Protestant listed as a geographic place name, be sure you reach out to Kate Carte at Southern Methodist University. Now, Kate, if we have more questions about religion and the American Revolution or the idea of the Protestant British Empire, Where's the best place for us to reach you? Well, probably the best place is Twitter, where I'm at K-E-C-A-R-T-E. Catherine Carte, thank you for helping us better understand Great Britain's Protestant empire and the role that religion played in different aspects of the American Revolution. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Although religion and religious issues did not foment or cause the American Revolution, religion did help early Americans think through imperial power and the role of government in their religious lives. Religion also helped those living in revolutionary America to cope with the war. As Kate reminded us, wars are violent, disruptive, destructive, and painful events. Especially civil wars like the War for Independence, which, in the case of many Anglican religious communities, had a tendency to rip congregations apart. It was in religion and in their religious beliefs that early Americans were able to think through the war and cope with the changes and death that it wrought. Religion is often what gave people the strength they needed to carry on and to continue their support for the American or British sides or to remain neutral. Now, popular accounts of the American Revolution often leave out how the event impacted religion and the role that religion would play in the new United States. But these are really important ideas for us to consider. Great Britain was a Protestant empire. The British often used Protestant religion as a way to expand its influence and territorial holdings. And the way that the British government supported Anglicanism, Presbyterianism, and Congregationalism with relative equality meant that the British Empire had a strong Protestant identity and also institutionalized religious toleration among Protestant denominations. But the new United States was not a Protestant empire. Its alliance with France during the War for Independence ensured that Protestantism couldn't be a favored religion by the new government. And without the imperial structures that had once told Americans What constituted a legitimate religion? Americans had to work out what role religion would play in their new political lives and whether religion might bar Americans from participating in their new government. The need to figure out the role religion would play in American political life is why Key contends that Americans didn't so much as create a purposeful separation between church and state as they left that relationship ambiguous. The relationship between church and state that had once existed in British North America had collapsed during and after the American Revolution, and trying to rebuild the connections and structures that had linked Protestant religion with the state proved too difficult. So Americans didn't repair these connections. Instead, they left religion and government disconnected or separated out of necessity. You can find more information about Kate, her book, Religion in the American Revolution, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, 
on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 311. Be sure to check out the Ben Franklin's World swag shop. Each purchase you make helps support this podcast. Visit the shop at benfranklinsworld.com slash shop. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what other questions do you have about religion in early America? What is it that you would like to explore next? Let me know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.